Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Good morning everyone. I'm Cindy Maka, the director of the Western Museum of Flight. After D-Day in 1944, Allied forces advanced very rapidly through the European theater. A major factor in this rapid advancement against the German ground forces was the superiority of Allied air forces. A significant participant in that effort is here with us today in the person of Ted Conlon. And it is my privilege to introduce to you Ted, so that he may share his experiences in this historical conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Conlon. Good afternoon, everybody. Probably the question asked of me most of the time was, why did you uh, want to be a fighter pilot? And I said, well, you know, it goes back a long way. When I was 12 or 13 years old, I got to messing around with model airplanes. And one thing led to another. And I got into the, uh, the real heroes of aviation at that time, the, the uh, Wright brothers and then the, the, all the war heroes. There was Eddie Rickenbacker and uh, Billy Mitchell, uh, Billy Bishop, and of course the incomparable Baron von Richthofen on the other side. And then we had the uh, second generation, which were uh, people like uh, Charles Lindbergh, who flew the Atlantic, as everybody knows, and uh, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, Amelia Earhart, couldn't leave her out, Wiley Post, Jimmy Doolittle, just a whole slew of them. And this, uh, plus the fact I got involved with the pulp paper magazines of the day, one of them sticks in my mind. It was called G8 and his Battle Aces. I'm sure some of you older guys probably read some of those. And that, uh, that was what really uh, inspired me. And I thought I'd like to be a, become a pilot. And about, I was about 18 years old, and I was, I was looking for a job. The Depression was still, still there. And a young friend of mine asked me if I wanted to take a ride in his airplane. I said, gee, I sure would. He had a Piper Cub. And I want to tell you, folks, that was a really eye-opener for me. First time I'd been off the ground that high, I remember it like it was yesterday. Flying around, we were over a, a lake, and I thought, this flying business gives you a total different perception of space and people and everything. So I decided I was going to become an aviator. I had to be. I had to learn to fly. But money was scarce, so I took a job. I was glad to get the job with Republic Aircraft in uh, Detroit. I was living on the outskirts of Detroit. And uh, I was going to save my money and take flying lessons. But something always, you know, like it comes up, something happened. I never got to it. But then... The Japanese made the sad mistake of hitting us at Pearl Harbor. And that opened up World War II for us. So I said, a uh, buddy of mine, I was in the bowling alley, and a buddy of mine got, got to calling me when I got home that night, and he said, let's go down and enlist. I said, wait a minute. I got two weeks vacation accumulated. I'm going to do that first. <laughs> really, I, I meant to do that. And I did. And in April, I went down with him and we took the entrance exams. And then on July 2nd, 1942, I was sworn in as an Army Air Corps reservist. They said to me, uh, don't call us, we'll call you. Go home and wait. Well, I went back to work. You know, August came by, September, October. The guys I was working with were asking me, what is this business? I thought you were in the, going in the service. So finally, I said my goodbyes, and off I went to Chicago. And I uh, got to Chicago, and they bundled us up and put us on a, another train and sent us to uh, what they called Classification Center at uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I luckily qualified as uh, pilot material, and they gave us the word, you're going to Santa Ana, California for 
pre-flight. Got out to the uh, Santa Ana Army Air Base, and uh, it wasn't easy, I'll tell you. Then we were finally ready to be sent out to the school, and uh, my luck was holding really great. They sent me to the country club of the United States Army Air Corps. It was Santa Maria, California, known as Hancock College. The reason they called it the country club was Everybody were civilians. We're introduced to uh, the German biplane. It was 225 horse. And when we graduated from there, we were sent to uh, Chico, California. And at Chico, we were introduced to the Volte vibrator, 450 horse, enclosed cockpit. And it had a two-speed prop, had flaps, and uh, we did acrobatics and night cross country. At the completion of our course up there, we were privileged to ask our instructors what schools we preferred to go to for advance. And I was off to Luke Field, and there we were introduced to the 600-horse North American Texan. And it was quite a jump. You go from 450 to 600, it's only 150 horsepower. However, you've also got a variable speed prop and uh, retractable landing gear. We did uh, a week at gunnery school, then we came back up and we got 10 hours in the Curtis uh, P-40 Warhawk. Uh, this was our first introduction to a truly, really war machine. This was the uh, culmination of our cadet program and we all graduated as flying officers on November 3rd, 1943. And we were given 30 days leave and our next station was Tallahassee, Florida, where we were uh, given equipment for our overseas and for all the necessary things a pilot would use in his entire career. Then we were sent to Tampa, Florida. Now this was another lucky strike. Tampa, Florida had P-51As. They hadn't been flown yet, except this was the first squadron of them that I know of. We got checked out in them, and. We, we did the basics, of, uh, learned how to do the acrobatics and uh, long-range navigation, and uh, we did uh, gunnery, ground strafing, dive bombing, and air-to-air. -air. Now we were ready. They decided they were going to send us up to, to uh, Fort Miles Standish in Rhode Island. And they uh, put us on a train, took us up to Boston Harbor, and offloaded us onto a German liner. That German liner had been captured in World War I and was refitted for our troop transport purposes in World War II. I remember there were about 200 of uh, us officers, of which about 60 were Army Air Corps, and uh, we had a surprise delegation of about 40 nurses newly graduated nurses from the U.S. Army. It didn't take us long to get acquainted with them. And their major jumped all over us. All of a sudden, we had guards at both ends of the gangways and <laughs> on the deck they were on, and uh, she sure was a party pooper. <laughs> we were, over that. We were on, a, on that ship for about five days. We landed at Liverpool and we were immediately put on a train and sent to a replacement center called Goxhill. They were flying uh, P-47s and P-38s, and they just introduced the P-51. What we were there for was to orientate the system, the way the uh, British system of coastal defense and uh, radar and radio communication. And uh, I had been to a dance up at Grimsby Cleethorpes, which is 40 miles due east of the field, and a town of about 100,000. And when I was at that uh, dance, we got tanked up at the local pub across the street first, and then went over to the dance. And uh, I met a young lady over there. I thought uh, she was really interesting for me, but she was only 16 years old. And I thought, well, just have to wait for her to grow up. And uh, so one day I, they gave me an airplane and said, go out and do some uh, local uh, flying around. 
I thought, well, okay, this is a good time to go up to Grimsby Cleethorpe. So I slipped on up there, went over to her house, and I dropped down to about a thousand feet, and I ran up the prop and made a little noise and wigwagged my wings. And just about that time, some other guy goes right by me, another P-51, chase me if you can, catch me if you can. He goes off and breaks to the left over to the beach and I followed him like a fool and chased him and we went down to the beach and they had, uh, there was a big uh, bridge there, a landing dock, and they had taken out the middle of the dock so that the German, in case they invaded, they couldn't use that. So the uh, other P-51 and I flew right through that airspace and, and then he disappeared. So I thought, well, maybe I better get back to Gox Hill. Well, I went in and landed and one of my buddies came over to me and he says, hey, Conlon, you weren't up near Grimsby Cleethorpe's, were you? I said, no, I was over in the practice area doing Shondell's Lazy Agent. He says, well, two idiots <laughs> alerted the whole British coastal defense system <laughs> and heads are gonna fall. I said, boy, I, I guess you know, I, I sure don't blame them for, that was very stupid. <laughs> I never did figure out who was the hot shot in front of me. Anyway, uh, after, uh, oh, by the way, that incident was written up in that evening's uh, uh, Grimsby uh, Night Telegraph, I think they call it, quite an article, which didn't help matters. Uh, that 16-year-old girl that I buzzed her house at uh, Cleethorpe's in 1944. She grew up, I married her. And uh, we have a, a daughter, a granddaughter that is here helping me, and a great-granddaughter. When we completed our uh, get ready, 10 of us were assigned to the 357th Fire Group. Again, a lucky strike for me. Now, the 10 of us, you know, we were replacements we were replacing uh, MIAs, KIAs, or whatever happened to them. Finally, we were ready for combat. And I was scheduled for the first mission on May 13th. At the briefing, the group was going to Berlin. The briefing officer called me aside and said, uh, Mr. Conlon, you're going to be radio relay on this mission. And I said, radio relay? What's that? He says, well, what you do is you take up a course of uh, zero, 010 zero, and reach an altitude of 25,000 feet and set up a, a parallel course, <coughs> equal legs on both the long side and equal short legs, and you fly that course and relay messages from Colonel Graham and the group that will be over Berlin. Apparently the communications weren't uh, that good uh, stretching that far. So uh, I did what I was told. I took off and flew out there. And didn't know where I was or why I was doing it, but I got out there and I set up a parallel course at 25,000 and pretty soon I made contact with Colonel uh, Graham. They were at the uh, Big B, and uh, <clears throat> he gave me a few messages which I relayed to London, and uh, then all of a sudden I wasn't getting any orders anymore. <laughs> I thought that was kind of strange, and I called for confirmation, and I didn't get any answers from anybody. London, my home base, nobody. And I thought, well, this is strange. I found a hole, weather had closed in underneath me, and I found a hole and I started to let down around it, and I went into a power spin, and all my senses told me that I was okay. My instruments told me I was in a straight down diving spin. There's where the training kicked in. Here I am brand new, my first mission, and I got myself together and I got back on the gauges, got the wings straightened out, 
he eats off on this route. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, I leveled off at about 2,000 feet. And in this descent from 25, I must have been pretty close to Mach 1. And I was pretty well shaken up, and I couldn't raise anybody. I was out there all by myself. So I decided to do the one thing I was trained to do. I set up a course for England. I was just guessing at it. I set up 270 and uh, started a gradual climb. And I climbed for about 15 minutes, and pretty soon I heard a slight reaction in my earphone. And I thought I heard him say, fly that course for another 15 minutes and call us back. And I did that. And the second time I called him, they came in very strong. And uh, it was London, and they uh, vectored me to 220, and uh, I went in and it uh, wasn't long and I made landfall. I was airborne five hours and five minutes. And I landed and uh, the uh, briefing officer said, well, how'd it go, anything uh, unusual out there? I said, no, it's just routine. I just set up a parallel like you guys said and had a few messages. He said, okay. I knew if I said anything different, I'd still be answering questions about where I was. May 21st, was when uh, we were briefed to uh, go on a rhubarb over uh, in the Berlin area, shoot up targets of opportunity, and the weather was so bad they didn't send the bombers. Anyway, on this mission that we were briefed, it was, the weather was too bad for the heavies, so they sent us out. And we were flying along merrily on our way. We were somewhere over near Hanover, uh, to our best guess, and uh, we had a complete cloud, cloud cover underneath. And all of a sudden, a tremendous amount of flack. So I guess that was Hanover. And we scattered like a bunch of geese. And I was confused. I didn't know where I was. I Finally, I saw two of our birds up in front of me, and I went up and joined with two of the more experienced pilots, uh, Lieutenant Ankeny and Starkey. So Ankeny took us on up north of Berlin. We found a peninsula up there, and Ankeny decided we were going to strafe that airfield. They had a pretty good-sized airfield, so we let down around 10 miles outside of the, of the uh, to east of the airfield, and uh, set up a course coming in. And I got everything all ready. My gun sight was on, and gun camera switch and everything. And all of a sudden, I noticed uh, Ankeny and Starkey were pulling away from me. I looked down, and I was doing about, about uh, 45 inches, and they were probably doing 60 inches. So I had to bring up the boost immediately. And I looked up, and there was a hangar right in front of me, and there was an airplane parked in front of it. So I let go for what little time I had, because my rate of closure was so fast. And I got off about 80 rounds into the airplane and hangar, and I did a sharp right turn, and wouldn't you know, I pivoted right over a 88 millimeter gun emplacement. I looked down, I saw and they were winding that big thing, trying to get it down on me. And I thought, no, thank you. And I saw Ankeny and Starkey, and uh, the water was about a half a mile off of the field, and uh, I hightailed it for that, and I was doing the zigzag, and they were shooting at me, but when I got to the water, then they were trying to splash me down, which was pretty clever. You know, 88 millimeter makes a big splash. So uh, we, I just got out of that, and I, and I went up and joined uh, Ankeny and Starkey, and here comes a, if I remember correctly, it was a yellow-nosed P-51 looking for a mother and father. He joined up with us. Ankeny brought him in, tucked him in under his wing, and, and wouldn't you know, right away, we wandered into another flak trap, and it was heavy stuff. And we, we made it back okay, and uh, Ankeny, uh, I saw Ankeny about, well, let's see, it was uh, 1998 at uh, the Air Force Academy, and he was still apologizing for taking us over that airfield. I said, Harry, we were paid to do that. That was our job. 
The next big event was D-Day. Now, we knew it was going to happen because I think Great Britain was actually tilting. We had so much stuff over there. We had armor and trucks and people, and it was just total chaos. And it was going on all night. They were moving people around. And so on the 4th of uh, June, we were coming back from a, a mission to France, and one of our guys looked down just as we neared our uh, home base there at uh, Leeson, and he said, gee, look at all those ships down there. We landed, and all of a sudden, we were hit with a storm because General Eisenhower heard about it, and he was upset because these were ships that were being moved down from the Scotland area to get in place down in Southampton for the jump over to France on June 6th. And we didn't know what the date was or anything. But on June 5th, which was the next day, we were grounded. Everything was shut down, nobody could get in or out. And they started painting the uh, invasion stripes on our aircraft. So we knew it was on. And that night, we had a, a big uh, meeting of everyone on the base, and uh, President Roosevelt spoke to us, and uh, uh, General uh, Eisenhower, and Hap Arnold. And uh, so then we knew that it was for sure the next day, and, and we had a squadron meeting right after the, all of that, which was around 10 o'clock at night, and got our assignments, and uh, my assignment was to fly wing for the squadron commander, Major Broadhead. So uh, I don't have to tell you guys and little girls, we didn't get much sleep that night. We're trying to figure out whether the Luftwaffe was going to come up in force or they were going to stand down. We didn't know. Our assignment was for the 357, we were assigned the area off of the Jersey and Guernsey Islands, and we were to set up a patrol there, the whole squadron, and uh, maintain that squadron. Let's see, we got down there at H minus uh, five minutes, that would be 555 hours, and uh, we didn't leave there until about uh, 1205 hours. So we were on station for that long. Now, before we took off, I should have used the restroom. And I thought, oh, what the hell? We got a relief tube on this North American P-51. So uh, Major Broadhead and I took off on instruments. And uh, we flew on a course down to uh, France northern France, and uh, I figured, well, once we got up on the station, I could take care of my problem. And uh, we got up there, and I, we just got organized. The entire squadron got set up on a, on a patrol, and I started to undo all my stuff, and uh, Major Broadhead called me and said, dollar six six, this is dollar leader. Let's go down and take a look at the beachhead. I thought, good God five miles down on instrument and five miles back up on instrument. But orders are orders and that's what we did. Jo uh, Major Broadhead and I broke out at about 2,000 feet because the weather was pretty bad. And we just missed uh, one of the leading German aces and his adjutant in two ME-109s they swept the beach from Cape du Hoc all the way down through the Canadians and the British and never made a return path. And we just missed him. Joe and I came down and knowing Broadhead, we'd have mixed it up with him. His name was Priller. Maybe some of you are familiar with him. Pritz Priller, I think they call him. And he was quite a renowned Luftwaffe ace. So anyway, uh, we got back to the base uh, at about just after noon and had lunch 
rested for an hour, and we went out on another sortie that afternoon over to Paris, France. And uh, so we put in a full day, and the Army Air Corps got their money's worth out of us. While we were flying over there, at, uh, we were over uh, La Brigade Airfield, and uh, some Weisenheimer on the ground with that 88 millimeter caught me right in his sight. And I got hit in both wings and the tail. These were fragments, but had he been another 50 feet up, he'd have had me right back on. I brought back the airplane and had a few holes in it. And my uh, wing, my uh, crew chief gave me a piece of timing ring that he pulled out of one of my tail empanages. So that was a D-Day. We had a mission on the 25th of July, and I was flying Captain Carson's wing. He was our uh, leading producer at the time. And uh, we were split into two half squadrons, uh, two flights each, eight aircraft each. And we swung down, we went in over the beachhead, swung down the uh, the uh, French uh, coastline down near Saint Nazaire, where the big submarine pens were. Then we did a big easy swing up to the left, and we were coming back at about 25,000 feet, and the visibility had to be 100 miles. It was just one of those gorgeous days in June, you could or July, you couldn't believe. And uh, just ahead of us, we saw a big gaggle of the enemy. 109s and 190. And while we were, we looked down and there were some P-38 guys having all kinds of fun, in some marshalling yards down on the outside of Paris. Well, the Germans never saw us. Their eyes were on that, those victims down below. And so Carson and I latched onto a Falk Wolf 190. And uh, in retrospect, I think the guy was probably a, not a very experienced pilot because first thing he started to do when Carson started getting hits on him, he started doing barrel rolls, which doesn't fool anybody. Carson was hitting him all the way around on the rolls. I'm trying to fly Carson's wing, and I'm watching the altimeter, and I figure if these boys that carry this on beyond 7,000, it's adios, senor. See you later. And uh, the uh, German obviously was pretty well shot up. I flew up alongside of him. By this time, we're down to 200 feet, and he's the engine. His engine's all shot up, smoking. He's leaned forward in the cockpit. He's gone, and I'm thinking, "Where's Carson?" And I see everybody on the ground shooting at me. I thought, "Well, this isn't very nice." I swing over to the Seine River, drop down on the, got as close to the right bank as I could, because they couldn't deflect on me that way. And some idiot stood on the shore, uh, stood on the bank of the river and shot at me with his handgun. And I, I gave him an unfriendly gesture as, we, as I went by. I got down to the Bois de Boulogne Park, and it looked like, you know, if they got any aircraft in the park, they got too many guns to begin with. So I decided to go out the parkway. And it's a huge public park, beautiful place. And uh, I was right. There were no guns in the park. And I got out, and now I started planning for my eventual, uh, I have to leave the continent sooner or later. I try to pick a place where there's very little flack. And I was lucky again. I hit a spot. Uh, I was climbing out and heading for least in our home base. and. And I went in and landed and uh, confirmed Carson's victory and uh, told him that I thought that uh, there must have been 10,000 machine guns mounted on the buildings because they were all shooting at us. And uh, Carson finished his tour. He finished his tour about the end of July. And I went to him after his final mission because I was his second in command. But nothing's sure in the Army, as everybody knows. So I said to Carson, 
I'm the new flight commander, right? The guy said, oh, sure, why not? I took over as flight commander, and I got his airplane, and his crew chief, and his armor, and the rest of his entourage. And I was very lucky again. John Warner, my crew chief, and I are still the closest of friends. I had him as crew chief from August until I finished in uh, October. And Carson had come back, and he wanted to go back with Carson, and I didn't blame him for that. I was in London on leave in uh, August, and I, I was having a leisure cup of tea and a sandwich in the, in the Ipswich Red Cross Club. And one of our, my flight guys came in, and he came running over to me. It was on a Saturday. He said, where have you been? I said, I've been in London. He says, well, you're scheduled to go on a flight to Russia. I said, Russia? He says, yeah. He says, man, everybody wants to go, and if you're not there, you're going to lose your place. So needless to say, I hardly finished the tea. I was out of there. I got on the train. I got back up to, to uh, Cleethorpes, I mean to uh, uh, Leeston, and I searched out the, my old buddy, the commanding officer, squadron leader, Major Joe Broadhead. I knew where to find him. He and the medical officer were at the bar, strange as it may seem. And uh, I went in and I said, uh, Major, am I scheduled to go on that Russian trip tomorrow? He said, yeah, you were. I said, well, I'm here. He said, yeah, but he says, you got to talk to the doc. You got three shots in each arm and they are no picnic before he'll let you go. So Doc Snedden said to me, you want to take three shots in each arm? I said, you bet I do. He says, okay, come on. He took me down to his office. He said, now your arms are going to be pretty sore. I said, just go ahead. So he uh, shot me up. And you know, when we took off, the next morning my arms were so sore I could hardly lift them. In 15 minutes, I didn't feel a thing. It's all gone. So uh, we got, we rendezvoused with the, uh, a wing of B-17s. We had a, a uh, group, which you'd have to call a super group, because a group was 48 aircraft, 16 in each squadron. And we had 72 for this Russian trip, so we must add every airplane that was flyable off the base. And uh, we went over, and after uh, they did some perfunctory bom bombing up in northern Germany, then they, we cut down into Russia. And uh, we had a fighter base at Piraten, and the bomber base was at Poltava. And so we were directed to Piraten. After two days, the group was scheduled to leave for Italy. So uh, we all took off for Italy. And I noticed uh, that I was having trouble keeping up. Every time I advanced the throttles, I'd have a backfire. And uh, I finally, I was losing them. So I called the Colonel, Colonel Graham, and said I couldn't keep up, and I was going to have to abort. He gave me the OK. And, I turned around and went back to Russia, went back to the Russian base at Piraten, and I had a heck of a time finding it. The uh, Russians, whatever else they did, they were very good at camouflage. And I, I flew around there for 10 minutes till I finally figured out which runway to land on. And we were there about uh, three more days, and I was a ranking officer there that had to come back. Five of us had to come back because of uh, bad uh, engine problems. Well, we found out when we landed, my crew chief, my American crew chief said, well, sir, the Russian crew chief put 80 octane in your tank. And I said, oh, that was what it was. And just about that time, they had a, a rank called third officer. Russian rank, and this guy comes over, this third officer, and he talks to the Russian crew chief, 
for about two seconds, and he reaches over and pulls out the biggest revolver I ever saw in my life. He's going to shoot the guy right then and there. And so my crew chief, my American crew chief, and I jumped in between them, and I outranked the guy so I could tell him, Niet, Niet, that's all I could think of in Russian. And so uh, my crew chief and the other crew chief convinced the guy that it wasn't really nice to shoot somebody over something like that, and we avoided the slaughter. Uh, we were gone exactly one week on that shuttle run from England to Piraten to San Severo and back to England, and we covered three war zones and had five confirmed shoot-downs no losses to bombers or fighters. And uh, we were, uh, later on we were received the declaration of the uh, patriotic, I think they call it the Medal of the Great Patriotic War for our efforts. Now Market Garden had all the elements of a huge conflagration. We were alerted that this was a big show and uh, it was Field Marshal Montgomery's show. And he had devised a plan where we were uh, to uh, bring the 82nd and the 101st Airborne up to Nijmegen and Arnhem and drop them, and they would consolidate that area, and thus they would close off any access of the Germans to get out of Holland. They'd have them trapped. Well, like a lot of things, certain things didn't go to plan. Number one, we didn't know it, but I think it was the 6th Panzer Corps was relieved of their frontline duties in, in the front lines down in Holland, Belgium, just about a week before, and sent up to the Arnhem area for rest. Now, this is the very area where the 82nd and the 101st is going to drop. And when we went in on the 17th, we took the, uh, the British, I think it was the 8th Airborne Army, and they, they used uh, C-47, they called them Dakotas, and they towed horse of, trailer, uh, horse of gliders. And uh, I don't know how many men, probably a, a uh, platoon of men in each one of these uh, horse of gliders. And we took them up uh, to Holland. They sent us up there about uh, two hours early, and we prowled around uh, at about 200 feet, and we were going around everywhere trying to find out what was going on with the enemy. And I saw some tanks, and I thought, gee, the, our uh, armor is really moving fast. They're already up here. So this should be pretty good. Well, you guessed it. They weren't ours. When the, when the uh, airdrop came up at Arnhem, it was unbelievable. Our job was to take the gliders in there and then go around on the other side and escort the Dakota C-47s back to the coast so they could get back to England. Well, most of them didn't make it through because they had the most vicious anti-aircraft set up and it looked like they already knew where we were going to drop. The drop zone, if I remember, was about 10 miles west of Arnhem, which is a pretty big town in Holland. And uh, it, was, it was a bloody show. And then uh, on the 9th, I, I stood down on the 18th. I had a, a bunch of eager beavers in my flight, and they were all complaining that I was flying too much, and they weren't getting any time. And I said, listen, you guys, if I start giving you guys time and I sit down, my classmates are finishing up, and they'll be out of here and back to the zone of the interior, and I'll still be with you guys. So I got to try to keep up with them. But I stood down on the 18th, and uh, it was part of this uh, market garden operation. And they went over, and they got into a pretty good mix. And uh, my wingman, uh, James Blanchard, he uh, scored 109, and my friend uh, who I had golfed with, he uh, got a victory with a 109, 
And uh, so I said, well, I got to go on the 19th. And I went on the 19th, and in a way, I was sorry I did, because uh, we were divided up into two half squadrons, and Cal <coughs> Williams, Captain Williams was leading the, the first half squadron. Now, I was his deputy that day, so I was flying just off his wing. And we were cruising on up uh, Holland, and we were headed for the Zyder Z, and nothing was happening. And we were cruising at our altitude, around 26,000 feet. And all of a sudden, we heard a lot of activity on our radios. So we knew something was happening. And what happens in a, in a fight, as the veterans here will tell you, everybody gets excited. You hold the, the mic button down, and you can hear all the cuss words, the whole schmear. And we could hear all this going on. We did a 180, Cal says to execute a 180, and so we turned around and we headed back down towards Arnhem and Nijmegen. And uh, Carson, I mean, um, uh, Williams said, drop tanks. And just when he said drop tanks, we all dropped them, but just then, right across my nose went 109, P-51, and a 109. And I did a hard bank left and latched onto the 109. And I had my K-14 sight on, and I was drawing those diamonds on him. And he was history in a matter of a few seconds. And all of a sudden, I got some company. I was getting a lot of, of uh, 20 millimeter over my left wing route. And I thought, who the hell is this? And I cut to the right and pulled up. I didn't think anybody would, could climb with me. I got up to 10,000, went into a Luffberry, and there was nobody. Absolutely nobody. Now, I'm excited. I'm scared. I'm mad. So the only thing I can think of is I gotta shoot somebody. <laughs> and I mean it. I put that bird into a down position, and I dove down to the, to the area. We, we had just left. And when I got down there, I saw nine burning wrecks over a period of about 25 miles. Some were ours, some were theirs. And nobody, not a soul, not a shot fired. I thought, well, this is kind of strange. I called for Williams. I called for my wingman. I didn't know who was in that P-51 that I tried to rescue. And I figured, well, I've got to go back to base. So I went back by myself. And uh, when I got back and landed, I uh, gave intelligence my debriefing. And uh, they said that, uh, that they were missing two, two that they knew of. One was my wingman, James Blanchard, and the other was the uh, total group leader for the day, Major Hero. And uh, as fate would have it, was Major Hero's last mission. He was finished his tour when that was done. As an after note to this story, in 1992, I got an email from a, a pilot in Holland. His name was John Emro, And he was a pilot for KLM. And he was also a member of the Dutch uh, Air Force and uh, a flying officer in the Dutch Air Force. And what their job was was to go around and dig up uh, facts and figures on old wrecks from World War II. And he said uh, in his uh, email, he said he thought I'd be interested in the fact that they had recovered my wingman's body in one of the canals right near where we were. And he was still strapped in and it was positive identification, it was him. And Major Hero, the group leader that day, went another 20 miles further east. He was the one in the middle, and he crashed, and uh, they buried him over there uh, in one of the German cemeteries. And then uh, I think uh, after they cleared up some kind of a mix-up, they finally brought him back 
to the United States. But uh, that was a that was a bridge too far. That's what the movie was about. Getting back to that uh, Holland episode in uh, September 19th, when the Hollander told me about who my enemies were and identify them by names and so on, it winds up that uh, I was pursuing Lieutenant Richard Franz. He was the third man in that daisy chain, and I was on him. And I was within several seconds of really destroying him. He, he wouldn't have lived through it. And he had, he had uh, been in the Luftwaffe since uh, the middle of 1943. He was an accomplished leader, and he had 17 victories. Uh, the other man that attacked me was happened to be a friend of his in a different squadron, and they were down strafing the Canadians when they saw us coming down, and uh, his name was Oberleutnant Rabluski, and he apparently was shooting at me, and naturally, like shooting at ducks, you never hit the lead duck, you always get the, the female following it. The male leads and the female gets hit with the shot, and so Jim Jim Blanchard was my wingman. When I saw those uh, 20s going over my left wing route, Jim was already shot down, probably dead. And uh, in the very next few seconds, both Richard Franz and Robluski were shot down. We don't know to this day who did it. I didn't do it because I never got a chance to fire it. And, uh, Rabluski wound up in the German Air Force, as did Richard Franz, and Rabluski wound up making Brigadier General. He was sent to uh, Washington, D.C. as Air Attaché in the uh, 70s, and he died of a heart attack about eight years ago. Richard Franz is still alive to this day. Every year, we send each other a birthday card. I send one to Richard, and I also send one to um, the other man. And they send me a birthday card and Christmas cards. And uh, Richard Franz does not operate a computer. It's gone past him. But the other guy does, and he's good at it. And in fact, he just retired. And I just had an email from him about three weeks ago and we compare different things, you know, how's the weather, so forth. But it's a, it's a strange world, isn't it, that we wind up being friends after such violent circumstances. Now, uh, I was telling you about my last mission. We fl I flew a couple more missions as a flight commander, and then I, I, my final mission was very unusual. They... Uh, uh, the briefing officer said, I want you to take your flight of four, go down to the uh, emergency base at Lan Manston, and pick up a mothership down there. And I don't remember whether it was a B-17 or what. I don't remember it, but he said, the mothership will have control of a B-17 and a B-24 that we refer to as Aphrodite's. And they're stripped of everything, and they're wired with 20,000 pounds of TNT each. And they're going to make a big bang when they go down. And he, he said, what you, we want you to do, your flight is to take the mothership and the two Aphrodites up to Heligoland and bring the mothership back. Well, this was about as great a milk run as anybody could ever get because we're over water all the way up the English Channel. We make a right turn and Heligoland's an island off of northern Germany. We take the, the uh, mothership and the two Aphrodite and there was a big mushroom of uh, activity of anti-aircraft at Heligoland. They sensed that we were coming but the minute that the mothership cut the two Aphrodite's loose all the firing stopped. 
those Germans hit the air raid shelter. And I, I watched the thing go off. And I've seen the uh, Hiroshima explosion, and this was an absolute duplicate. 40,000 pounds of TNT concentrated in one area like that, and it was a thing of beauty. So I uh, did a 180 with the mothership and brought her back to England and said goodbye, and came into the, to the air base, my air base, and the custom was when you finish, you do a few rolls, and, uh, no, I've had it. I, I just flew over, wigwagged my wings a little bit, and went down and very docilely landed my airplane, and that was it. I did 71 missions, 270 combat hours, and I had uh, one EA destroyed on the ground. Uh, there's a story on that. Uh, I was looking over my 201 file and then my combat report. I noticed they had given me an EA destroyed on May 21st. And I never claimed any aircraft destroyed. So I turned it over to our historian who checked his record. And he says, well, they must have given it to you because... And I remember that it was of particular interest to the intelligence guys when they called me back down for the, for the uh, re-interview because they, they uh, asked me a lot of questions about the airplane. I said, well, I didn't see much of it. The airplane was parked in front of the hangar, and I only got off uh, 80 rounds, and I got out of there. And I heard them talking about a, a Rado 234, which at the time was highly secret. It was our first uh, German medium bomber of jet engine construction. And apparently in May it was, was still not a war machine. It was in the experimental stage. And they gave me credit for destroying that. Okay, I did crash when I was squadron leader. First and only time that I got to fly the squadron, I was instructed to take them over and uh, cruise the fighter belt line and see if I could tease anybody up to fight, which we did. We flew over uh, Munster and Bealefield and all those other places where we knew they were, they were stationed and nobody came up. And so I took the, the squadron around and did a big UE and 180 back to England and I was up around uh, Dummer Lake, and I thought I was going to give them the order to drop tanks, because we had plenty of fuel and only about 40 minutes to England. And normally, almost without exception, I would drop my tanks and forget the switch, and the engines would cut off, and I'd have to reach out and get them back going again. Well, this time, because I was the squadron leader, I guess, I told them to drop tanks, and I reached down to switch mine so I didn't run out, and I couldn't move the switch. It was frozen. And later on, we figured that what had happened was that the, the, uh, there were little rubber ga gossets. When you match up the holes, the, these... Uh, rubber things match up together and allow the fuel to flow. But what happened was the, the, the gossets were okay, but the mucilage that held them to the metal thing had eaten away due to this high octane fuel we were using. So they, they, the engineers figured that they swelled up and locked the selector switch. Now I'm on my drops I've been on my drops by the watch for about two hours. And I don't know how much time I got left. So I had a major Gioriso fly on my wing that day. And I turned the flight over to the, my deputy. And major and I started looking for a place to sit down. I, I, didn't, I knew I didn't have enough fuel to go back across the channel. And uh, I got a vector from London. The major got it for me. And uh, they said, uh, Amsterdam. So we went over to Amsterdam, Holland, and I, I uh, looked down and I dropped down on the field and I could see they were fighting. The north and south were fighting. 
the bad guys were on the north and the good guys on the south. And that didn't look too promising. And then they had uh, pipes put into the runways, made them not usable. So I asked the major to get me another fix, and he got me Brussels. And Brussels had just been captured by our forces uh, two days before. So I hightailed it over to Brussels, and I made one pass, and I was wigwagging my way to let them know I was in trouble. And they were bringing in gasoline for the armored division. They were bringing them in on C-47s, and those guys were coming in one after the other. And so finally I just had to wedge in between two of them. And I, I just got in between them and I got caught in a prop wash and I was on the ground. Now I got a full load of fuel in those wings. And my drop tanks are paper, thank God. I'm sliding on them like uh, I didn't have time to put down the gear. I'm sliding on them like uh, uh, like a sled, and I turned off everything, and I ejected the canopy because I wasn't going to burn up in that thing. I was going to roll out and take my chances on the, hitting the runway. I finished up my tour, and I was sent back to the zone of the interior. I went through uh, Air Force Instructor School at Randolph Field. I had three classes to teach at uh, Moran, Arizona. Finished that, and I was sent to uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina. I was supposed to instruct in P-47. And I thought, oh, that bird is enormous, 15,000 pounds. And a cockpit, you could run around in the thing. I never did thoroughly be honest about it, master the techniques. I did a split S with three trainee officers. And when I split S, I was about 11,000. I figured, you know, I'd pull out about 9,000, it didn't happen. I had both feet on the instrument panel, pulling back on that thing and whining and trim tab, and I, I just barely got out of it. So that was my last time to split S. So that was about it for my military career. Well, with that, I, I want to thank you all for being so patient. I hope to see you again. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time. Music